the first question I wanted to ask is, uh, is the fact that I perceived some irony in the film, because um, first of all, the, the humans, they don't appear a lot, but when we see the humans in Welcome to Erewhon, they tend to be a bit uh, ridiculous, a bit pitiful, and I, I tended to feel a bit sorry for them. So I was wondering if it's because it reflects your opinion that automation over time is going to condemn all human beings to live uh, on the margins. Pierre, do you want to start? Um, um, so <clears throat> We we had we had a lot of discussions about the uh, the humans in in Erevon, and one thing we didn't want to do was a dystopia, and we wanted to remain in a in a kind of ambiguity, um, with uh, in a kind of ambiguity where one would see the humans and they would be both they would seem happy, and we we thought it was very important that the humans in Erevon are happy, and in a way. Everything is organized uh, for them to be happy, even though they may not be at the center of the city. But it's important for the machines in Erewhon that the humans are happy. And they are happy, but indeed they seem to be uh, sort of uh, a bit lost, or at least they're not in control. And so, in a way, we, yeah. We really wanted to be in a in a sort of ambiguity where the viewer would be surprised and and would not have a, a definite idea whether it was good or bad uh, for the human these uh, this automatization. Mm. Yes, and maybe we could add that. Uh, well, it's a film that we. We created uh, it's, it's the creation of three persons who have uh, different views on the film: uh, Pierre, uh, me, and Guénola Lagon. And also, it's also the creation of uh, the recreation of Samuel Butler. So we wanted to rewrite mm -hmm. Erewhon, which is a, a very famous novel from the 19th century, and to imagine what Samuel Butler would think if he was projected in our times, and if he would. Um, see some images on YouTube that describe an automated world and that you would try to understand what what is happening and how the human beings could live in a world where everything is automatic. So in a way this irony that uh, you can sense in the film is also the irony of someone who is trying to to understand what who doesn't have the, the codes to understand the beginning of the 21st century from the point of view of a person of the 19th century, but with still an English writer with a, a, mm. a lot of irony on the way he describes and the way he views things. So yes, I would say that the point of view that we try to, to put in, in Erewhon, as, as Pierre said, is it's definitely not a dystopia. It's, it's more like, um, someone trying to to someone who would take everything he sees as the reality everything he would see on youtube and he would analyze the way people live according to this reality and he would sense in a way that human beings are becoming some kind of domestic animals uh, which are taken care of by robots but it would uh, mostly amuse him in a way it's also yeah i see Stefan said, so, sorry, as Stefan said, it's a very important uh, claim from Butler in the novel er Erewhon that um, instead of, uh, as, we, as we usually think, instead of having humans using the machines, it is the machines mm. which are using humans in order to develop, like if you you know if you take the relationship between the car and the humans you can consider that i am using um the my car to go to the beach but you can also consider that the car in a way is using me or the cars in general are using human in order to um to get better that is you know when i've used my car um i'm gonna buy a new car 
which is going to be, you know, more pretty, more uh, uh, efficient, which is going to go faster, whatever. So in a way, the, in from the standpoint of Butler, the machines always um, try to trick humans into using them so as to produce new generation of machines and, and evolve. So Butler is... is uh, insisting in the novel Erevon and the chapters, the, the book uh, of machine, that the machine will do everything in order to uh, keep humans happy and will use uh, humans, just as in a way uh, flowers use bees in order to uh, have, uh, you know, to reproduce. And so, you know, the flower is trying to attract the bee in a way. So machine are are trying, uh, in a way, as a flower without intelligence, are trying to uh, attract us and use us in order to, to evolve. And so the machine needs us to be happy. And so we wanted to take that claim and, in a way, work on it so that we would uh, not choose between the two usual alter alternatives of the dystopia, you know, like, I don't know, the world of Matrix, for instance, or the dystopia or the opposite view where um, automatization would bring perfect happiness to the to the humans. Or like when you're work, when you're looking at a commercials, at a commercial for a new technological device, like a new phone, you see, you know, the humans using the new phone and they look so happy, perfectly happy. <laughs> And so we wanted to use this image of the new, you know, the human using the new phone, and he looks so happy. But if you concentrate on him or her, he looks or her, she looks kind of strange, a bit, in a way, a bit too happy, a bit lost, maybe idiotic. And so, yeah, that's really the turning Butler's claim into an ambiguous future for, for humans or an ambiguous uh, possibility. Uh, possible for the humans. I think that's really what what charmed and surprised me because when talking about the future, when talking about uh, machine intelligence, most of uh, the thinkers or the artists they tend to fall into dystopia, and um, and you went in the totally opposite direction. And I think that's what what I found so so fascinating. And I was also impressed with uh, what you did with all the footage that you found and, and maybe it's a stupid question but have you ever been tempted to delegate the whole editing process to a machine do you think that in the future uh, a machine would be able to do that to do um, a big part of the creative uh, work instead instead of you it's an interesting question i would i would like maybe just to come back for one second to the previous question um, because um, in a way one other thing which is very important in in era one is that it's uh, it's not an utopia or, or is it dystopia because it's a fiction and um, mm -hmm. as a fiction it, it goes in a different direction and our narrator Samuel Butler who is a uh, dead but who is recreated as a as, as a as a conversation robot um, he, he lacks a lot of information. For instance, he lacks a lot of information about who is creating these automatic uh, robots that he sees uh, on the YouTube videos that he collects. And uh, so he's, he's missing a lot of information. So he sees robots and human beings together, but he does not see who is creating this, these robots. Well, except at the end of the film, he guesses a little bit. And so he's trying to to understand what's happening, but he's not in the position of having a, um, a point of view to say that it's good or bad. And another point that I think is quite important, it's uh, everyone is, in my view, it's not exactly a film about the future. Maybe it's a film about the present, maybe it's a film about the past, mm -hmm. and maybe in a little bit it's a film about the future. But it's it's we, we really wanted to put ourselves in the position of uh, of someone who is completely out of our world and who is coming to this world by one unique point of view, which is watching videos on YouTube. He collects a lot of them and he's trying to understand them, but 
in his mind, he's a man of the past, looking at the present, and he analyzes it in this way. So maybe everyone is not about the future. It's about something which is already there, and it is why we are collecting videos from today. I mean, these videos could be commercials for a better future in the, mm. in the mind of the people who, who create them. But it's also about the present because it's the way that today these people see the world. So we, I think we take them as a view on the present and we do not try to, we do, we do not try too much to project about what would really happen in the future or will it be good or will it be bad, but just what are the fantasies that we can observe right now and how can, can we make sense or maybe how can we make nonsense out of them or no, it's not sense or nonsense. It's more like how can we speculate uh, about the relationship that we have with the machines and that the machines have with cats and with robots, etc., and try to create a fiction out of it. Yeah, what Stefan um, uh, is saying is very important. It, it's uh, it's really not about the, the future. And if we try mm. to imagine what the future would look like, we we would probably not do the, the same film uh, at all, or you would, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, and moreover, I don't think uh, artists, writers, or even philosophers um, can ever speak about the future. Uh, speaking about the future is a job for scientists. Like if I'm a, phys a physicist and I look at the apple on the tree and the apple falls, I can calculate or I can try and calculate at least with what speed the, the apple would reach the, the, the ground. Maybe a sociologist can claim to be able to do that uh, with uh, human relations. But I don't think it's the job for philosophers, writers or artists to do anything like that. And to me, uh, uh, philosophers as writers and artists rather try to explore a sort of possible that is contained in the present. And as Stefan said, we are more making um, a, kind, a sort of documentary almost and, and let's say oriented inventory of the contemporary images of uh, automatization and so that's why we use uh, only found footage in a way Erevon is not in the future er Erevon is here but it's not here on the earth or it's not here somewhere on the earth it's here in the the memories of our computers in the sort of images that uh, circulate on social networks um, and to come back to your question about could we have used or could we have imagined using an algorithm that would uh, have uh, edited the film uh, for instead of ourselves? Well, first, probably uh, there's no algorithm uh, capable of uh, making such a good film as we did. I mean, usually <laughs> uh, when you try to have an algorithm making a film or writing a story, it's pretty confusing. Um, and at the moment, I don't think there are really uh, algorithms that are that good. And really, um, at this, on one side, we've been taken, we've been taking images from uh, basically social networks. Um, but there's also, I mean, there's a lot of editing uh, going into the movie and the images are also changed. In a way, it's, uh, uh, this found footage is a way to make our work sort of invisible, uh, as is often work on the digital sphere today, but there's a lot of human work uh, uh, going in the film. Mm -hmm. um, and also, maybe to come back to the point of fiction, um, we really wanted to to believe that we were Samuel Butler uh, looking at the present. So to believe that we had to maybe put ourselves in a position of, uh, of, of writing actual texts and uh, writing actual stories. So to put 
ourselves in the position of being someone of the 19th century, which in a way prevented us from using algorithms to write the film mm. or to edit it. But now for a, a future project, it would it could be very interesting to to use algorithms for a, for a different perspective um, on the subject. One other thing that I would like to say about this question is that, and it's quite the opposite that what I from what I just said is that actually we did use algorithms to create this film because the videos that we collected patiently we collected hundreds and thousands of videos and. We use the algorithms of YouTube and Google to mm. find these videos because we 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 go very deep inside uh, these uh, research tools and to find these videos that no one has. Well, some of them, many people have seen them before, but some of the videos that we saw are, are very uh, have been seen by a very very uh, little number of people. And to find these videos, we have to really follow the the, the the algorithms uh, until the end and to to go very deep inside the suggestions of uh, YouTube and Google um, but yes for the rest of the film it's it's much more human work it's much more like a, a mechanical tour cooperation in which uh, you are it's it looks like a machine but uh, in inside it's a human being which is uh, working thank you I was also wondering um why it was important for you to start with the work of uh, literary fiction and, and, and I was wondering um, how can speculation and fiction in general uh, help us develop a, an interesting perspective on technology and on the kind of impact it's going to have on, on society and, and on culture? Well, so the, the answer could be very simple. Um, since the film was created by three persons, um, Everyone by Butler is a book that uh, the three of us uh, adored in a way. So we, we, we all loved this book. We had read it before to before we wanted to work together. We had already read the book and well, Pierre is working in speculative philosophy. And uh, so it, it's, it's really a book that was very important to us. Um, also because it contains a book of the machines, which is a, a completely crazy work of uh, of speculation in which Samuel Butler in the 19th century predicts that uh, machines could evolve faster than human beings or faster than animals and, and take over the planet. And he's creating a fiction in which uh, the people of Erewhon live and uh, prohibit completely the use of machines. Um, so, so it was quite obvious since we wanted to work with automation to to take the opposite and to imagine that Samuel Butler comes back to the present and finds a world in which, uh, in which, well, of course, machines have not been prohibited, but it's it's quite the opposite and machines are everywhere. So it was a the starting point for for the fiction. Uh, y yes, to 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 what can to come back to the question about what can uh, fiction do for the present? Um, again, uh, uh, fiction, be it philosophical fiction, literary fiction, but also uh, sort some sort of fiction that one can find in some artistic dispositive. Um, to me, they don't tell the future, uh, but what they can do is to explore uh, various possibilities that are contained in the present and through this possibility um, describe uh, forms of life, form of life, form of life um, in which we imagine ourselves, which we can imagine to adopt. Um, so in this way it would be possible futures, but also forms of life which um, show how in the present some features are essential that we cannot even imagine this feature to disappear. And some are on the other side uh, contingent. We, can, we could do without them. So in a way it's also so it's also a, a way to discriminate 
in the present uh, what is really necessary or what we want to uh, put emphasis on um, and in a way maybe help us make a choice about uh, where we want to go. Um, so for instance, um, I to me, one of the questions that we uh, put forward in area one or on which we put in phases on is the happiness uh, that we, um, the happiness that uh, we feel towards technology. Like in a way, the two chapters that are really opposite is uh, the chapter on um the animals and the chapters and engineer and engineer dream that really the chapter on engineer dream we only start through uh, we only start with uh, commercials for really sometimes stupid technological device like a fridge that tells you uh, you know to buy milk when mm. it feels that there's no milk inside inside itself and instead of focusing on the fridge, as in the commercial, we rather uh, focus on the face of the human who is so happy to use this, this fridge. And what is this kind of happiness? Uh, is it really the kind of happiness we want? Is it really possible or is it somehow uh, abstract, like in the bad sense of abstraction? Is it remote from real life and in a way the chapter on animals presents uh, another side of happiness in Erevon uh, in Erevon and the side so the chapter on animals there are really two parts the people uh, caressing animals and having this kind of very tactile relationship with animals and on the other side uh, animal factories that are used uh, to produce you know like uh, hamburgers so um, this happiness with animals is also remote and abstract because you know they love their animals but they're also uh you know the city is doing something in a way cruel let us say uh to to animals so it's really yeah about uh, not telling the future but discriminating in the present um what's what's going on and what features are in a way contingent, essential or, or abstract. It's really a, a, a way to look uh, through the prism of, of the possible to look critically at the present. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. I, I have one last question. I was wondering if there was any place for Luddites in Erewhon, because if I think of today, uh, there is, of course, there are writers, there are thinkers, there are artists, there are activists who say, well, technology in particular, artificial intelligence is, is going too far, there are biases, but I feel um, there's not really a, a, a big space for, for Luddites um, today. So what's your perspective on this? I'm not sure that everyone has an answer to this question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I do have an, an answer to this question, but it's an interesting question. Um, what, what is funny is that um, in the second chapter of the of the film, we tell the story of, well, the, the actual story of Samuel Butler in Erewhon in the 19th century, we, with uh, going to this place, which is a kind of... Uh, well, everyone in the in the book, everyone by Samuel Butler, it's it's the acme of Luddism, because it's a, a people who have prohibited all machines, so it's a, a successful Luddism in a way, mm -hmm. and um, and in a way, everyone uh, in our film, it's exactly the opposite. We wanted to go like exactly in the in the other direction. So, uh, and it's of course as uh, as when you write a, a story, a fiction, you need to. To, to be a bit out of reality if you want to be if you want to, to make a point so we we put Luddism completely out of sight <laughs> in a way so so there is no Luddism in the film now should there be Luddism in the reality 
I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe they they the the people we we the people we show in Erevon are completely dependent on machines and they've completely lost controls control not only of the management of the city so to speak but also of their own lives and and relationship to 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 the machine they're they're like kids having fun um, mm -hmm. and and but on the other way um, sometimes they seem to uh, to um, I'm looking for the French word détourné. Uh, there, there are. Uh, they seem to be using the machines in a way the machines are not made to be used. So they don't destroy the machine, but maybe on the margin they still, by small deviation, try mm -hmm. and go elsewhere and play with the machine in a way the machines were not made to be played with. Um, and in a way, that's also what we do with, with the film. We use, you know, images that are not really made by the machine, but that circulate on social met network with a certain function. Most of them are commercials for certain technological device. And we use them in another way. We try and make them show something else. So it's not ludism in the sense of, of um, you know destroying the machine, but it's still uh, um, maybe a non-conformist use of the machine, mm. uh, um, a, a deviation at least from a certain um, techno technological progress. Let's say with quotation mark around progress. <laughs> 